Hello and welcome to Behold Podcast, a ministry of Arcade Church. My name is Craig Hardinger. I'm on staff at Arcade Church, and I am really missing my partner in crime. Beth is on sabbatical. Uh, she's been on sabbatical, what, nine, ten months? Something like that. <laughs> super <laughs> long, like super long time. Anyway, by the time this airs, she'll have been back. But uh, she's missed... And uh, it's, it's great, though, to be with you today. I, I did want to take a moment just to talk about why we do Behold Podcast. And one of the reasons for that is because uh, we want to be able to talk about things that we typically don't have time for or we just can't on Sunday mornings. And we want to deal sometimes with controversial issues like we're going to be talking about today, uh, things that perhaps there might be some disagreement, but we want to be able to deal with that in a way that is Christ-centered, but then end every episode with a devotional on beholding Jesus. That is what it's all about, and I'm very excited about that. Today, for this episode, we are going to be talking about something, it is the dirty word of our culture, politics. And I've asked the team, I've asked the team to drop this episode um, on as close to the Tuesday, the first Tuesday of November this year, signifying that we are one year away from election 24. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be so great. And I'm being, you know I'm being facetious here. But one of the reasons why I want to do this is because we have really kind of an advantage here at Arcade Church. We have in one of our leaders, someone who has been in the stream of politics for many, many years, and that is Dan Dunmoyer, and he is going to be the guest for this episode and the next. And so, Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about something, really, that that is your expertise. You, you've, you've been swimming in this stream for how many years? Probably since you graduated from... Now it goes back to pre-high school. So thanks for the opportunity. Pre-high school? But yes, but my first elected office was when I was 15. Okay. So I, that's when I started to get and that the bug was of politics. Like school patrol? That was commissioner of finance. Whoa, I know, nice. that sounds really nice. Yeah. I had a $100,000 budget as a 15-year-old. You're kidding. Back in the dark ages, 19, you know, That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Well, I know you were student body president at USC. And at Hemet High School. And Hemet and High, okay, so you've been involved in a lot of things. And one of the reasons why we've wanted to have Dan sit at this table and talk about this is, number one, um, the gospel is central for you. It's uncompromising for you. You have this robust faith in Christ that is exemplary, not just on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday. And, and that's huge in our culture because you are swimming in the arena of California politics where the Christian gospel is not elevated very much. Correct. And so you've had to learn over the years to navigate what that looks like. And so I, I, we didn't rehearse this, but I just want just talk a little bit about that. First of all, I want to hear about your family for our listeners that aren't familiar with Arcade Church, but then also just the the political swimming that you've had to do over the years, maybe who you've worked for, some of the governors that you've known, all that kind of stuff. And so just kind of go off on that a little bit. Well, again, Craig, thanks for the opportunity. It's great to be here today. And this is one of my favorite subjects to speak about. And as you know, religion and politics are the two things you don't talk about at the dinner table. And today we'll be talking about both of those. Both of them, that's at right. This table. Yeah. And we won't even hate each other <laughs> no, after the process. That's the prayer, yeah. literally. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so came up here from Southern California in 1984, brought up as a, what's called an assembly fellow. And it's a program to get young people involved in public policy. Um, I've had the privilege of, of working in politics since then here in Sacramento, but also in the U.S. government, federal government, but also in governments in Europe and North and South mm -hmm. America, so kind of a global perspective. Mm -hmm. Met my lovely bride, Leilani, here at Arcade in the singles class. Uh, we have three wonderful children, Heather, who just recently married, as you know, thank yeah. you, Yeah. and David and Nathan, so uh, all out of college. So I'm a much more well-heeled financially. Um, so it's amazing how big a raise you get when your kids graduate. Exactly. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah. And so been in Sacramento, although I've worked globally and, and locally, I've been uh, located here in Sacramento since mm -hmm. I graduated from college. So uh, and been involved in the public policy arena since I was a teenager. Is it true that from a, from a California politics perspective, you've 
pretty much done everything there is to do except run for political office. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, started out and, as... And you know, I'm trying to convince you <laughs> to run, but you won't do it. Well, but uh, You have to yeah. talk to my boss. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, I will. It, yeah, if she would talk to me, that's, that's true. Um, so the bottom line, this whole episode, Dan, is tell me who I should vote for and why. That's all I want to know. Who do I vote for and why? I mean, because already the Republican debates are going on, and it's exactly what we thought it would be. Right. Um, nothing's, nothing seems to be unpredictable. We've, we've seen this coming and it's going to be a free for all for the next several months, um, based upon the last couple of elections that we've had and COVID was in there. So that muddied the waters a little bit. I, I sense a kind of dread as I talk to church leaders, um, as we are, who are in church leadership, we're talking to pastors, we're talking to elders of other churches, and we are just lamenting the next 12 months about what this could do to the country, but also what we have seen historically, what it's done to the church. How, how would you give us some wisdom on how we should respond to that kind of divisiveness, um, tribalism uh, that we're facing in our world today and in the church? Great question, and it's a great challenge of our day, and particularly because go just back, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we didn't have all the social media platforms, we didn't yeah. have the 24 hour news, we didn't have the cancel culture, the gotcha culture. I mean, it used to be three stations, and news is maybe an hour, two hours a day mm -hmm. per station. And, you know, breaking news was something that happened 24 to 36 hours ago. Now, breaking news is 24 to 36 seconds ago, mm -hmm. and it's just very constant. And it evolves quickly and goes viral and then collapses. Um, people's fortunes live and die within minutes now as opposed yeah. to weeks, months, and years. So to the issue of dread, I mean, it is frustrating to see this process. Um, but it is, as Winston Churchill said, democracy is really ugly, awkward, and, and hard to deal with and still yet the best form of government yeah. Yeah. because at least we're at the table. Yeah. As we're at this table... We have a saying in public policy that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, and you're going to get devoured <laughs> by somebody else. So you want to be at to, the table. We need to use that <laughs> somehow. I like that. I like that. So it, you need to be at the table, as frustrating as it is. Yeah. To the question of divisiveness, it's amazing that even within the Christian community, uh, and I'll say similar faith, I'll even stick within one kind of denominational group of Protestants, mm -hmm. um, you'll have a radically different view of who you should vote for, how you should participate, if you should participate. Then you bring Catholicism into it, you have that. Then you have bring in the secular society of honorable people of all perspectives, and the conflicts just grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. To your question of dread, um, it's not a dictatorship, so you have a chance to participate. Yeah. And one of the things that I find is amazing is you know, how few people choose to participate, partly because of this dread, mm -hmm. partly because I don't think my vote really matters, Yeah. so why would I show up? And partly just a sense of, I don't like any of these people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a normal response, but not the right response. Mm -hmm. So there's a litany of elections where you can say within, we almost elected a different president with 200 votes in the state of Florida. So your vote does matter, mm -hmm. but more importantly, your participation is really important for this process of democracy to work. So yeah. how, would you, how would you then uh, encourage someone that just comes to you and says, hey, I'm a Christian, and I'm just, I'm just checking out. This, this, this kingdom, I'm about God's kingdom. I'm about the kingdom of Jesus, and so I just don't want to be a part of this government, this kingdom, and so I'm just going to check out and try to get people saved. How, how would you respond to someone like that? Because we probably know people like that in RK. And it's not an unnatural response, especially with the current dynamics of people in leadership. Yeah. I think the key thing is, did Jesus check out? When asked about the toughest political question he was ever asked, you know, keep in mind, we think we have it tough now. Um, Caesar was a little more tough. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. The Herodian process, Herod was you know, trying to constantly kill this guy known as Jesus Christ. And yet when given that tough political question, um, that the Pharisees put the Herodians up to come after Jesus and say, okay, do you pay your taxes effectively? Mm -hmm. And that wasn't just like an income tax, that was a tax on you as a human being, which admitted that you were under the power of Rome, which was the ultimate insult to a Jew. 
And Jesus has said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, unto God that which is God's. He didn't say, forget about Caesar. Right. It's all about God. Mm -hmm. And if anybody on the planet could have said it, being God in the flesh, it was Jesus Christ. Yeah. But he opted to say, no, there's a portion of what your life here needs to be in respect to those in authority, and of course, respect to the ultimate authority of God. Mm -hmm. So he didn't run away from that. The key thing to keep in mind, the politics of that question were profound. The Rhodians were the Jews that played politics with the Romans. Mm -hmm. And a good Pharisee really didn't like them. They're almost like a tax collector to them because they were playing with the bad guys. But they sided together. They disliked Jesus. They hated Jesus so much. They sided together to ask him the toughest political question. And Jesus' response was, respect Caesar. Mm -hmm. Pay your taxes. And of course, respect my father. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the process. And so, no, we shouldn't check out. If Jesus didn't check out, he's our leader. He's our example, and we should participate in this process. We are commanded to to vote by our leaders. They tell us to show up and vote, everyone, yeah. all parties, all stripes. So that's also a directive from those in authority. And it's, it's you know, they don't say stay home. <laughs> yeah, they say get involved. So we're we're commanded by them to stay involved, and we need to stay involved. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's difficult too, because um, it's interesting you mentioned that passage with Jesus and Caesar. Uh, you know we're. We've talked about this before in other arenas, but the difficult thing is the the Bible wasn't written to us; it was written for us. It wasn't it, it, when when Matthew wrote his gospel, when Paul wrote his letters, he was not thinking of twenty first century Americans in mind as he wrote those letters, and so it can be difficult for us to to transition into from something that is separated from seven thousand miles of culture, two thousand years of history and all of a sudden try to find a way to be able to live in this. I mean, if, can you imagine if you were to tell Paul, if we were to go back in time and tell Paul, hey, listen, uh, just so you know, uh, we live in a free society, and let me tell you what that looks like. Mm. I mean, he would go, you got to be kidding me. That's wonderful. That is great. You mean you, you have a say in who the emperor is? Oh, no, 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 it's not an emperor, it's a president. It's not a dictator, it's a president. And to your point... Yeah, it's not going the way that we like often. Maybe our candidate doesn't win like we'd like, but it's a system that is beneficial in a free society, and we need to take advantage of that. Is that kind of what you would encourage someone who just wants to tap out and just say, I'm done. I'm done with the whole process. Definitely, Craig. I mean, that is a great summary. If you have a bad president, he or she's limited to eight years. Yeah. Um, if you don't like where you, how your state's operating, you can move. You can get up and move to a different country. Mm -hmm. I'm not recommending that, but I'm saying you have those freedoms. You can mm -hmm. certainly cross borders to faraway places like Nevada or faraway places like Idaho. Hey, 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 hey. careful, buddy. Watch it, watch <laughs> it. But you have those options. Yeah. And, so, and you also can move from big cities to suburbs. You can choose where you, you raise your family. And if you think of that time, the great example you gave of Paul, I mean, you had a lot of limitation. Rome was omnipotent. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they didn't like Christians. And obviously, Paul wasn't liked by either the Romans or by the Jewish leadership. And I mean, we may have people who don't like us today. That's definite, yeah. but yeah. a different dynamic. We don't do that from prison. We do that from the corner. Yeah. Where we can express our views. We can do that through our social media tools, through voting, through other processes. And... Um, no, it's not perfect, and no, it's very frustrating because mm -hmm. some of the stuff that happens doesn't make any sense to a believer, but it is a process that allows us to, to express that, and that's, that's pretty special. And what would the alternative be? Well, as long as I'm the dictator, um, yeah. that would be a good di dictatorship. That's a yeah. joke. <laughs> but I mean, nobody, you know, because we don't want one dictator, the other yeah. process is totalitarian governments, whether yeah. it's, you know, look at the Soviet Union right now, President Biden got... Blame for calling the the premier of chi China a thug, but you know you have this dynamic where you have two powers in this world right now, the Russians and Chinese. Where when you express your opposition to Mr. Putin, you you may end up dead. Yeah. And as much as we have conspiracy theories in the U.S., poisoning of people who disagree with Mr. Biden doesn't occur very often. Yeah. Like never. Never. Where in other countries, it seems like every time you disagree with the leader, you're a fraudulent character. At first, I thought, man, these people are always ripping government off, which they might be. But once they disagree, there's fraud. Mm -hmm. And so you go to jail. Not They never say, you disagree with me politically. That mm -hmm. just doesn't pass the global smell test. So whenever you see a major leader in a despotic government 
being arrested for fraud when two weeks before they disagreed with them, you know what's happening. Yeah. They're being pulled out of that government and they're gone. Yeah. In some yeah. cases, they're dead. And in the U.S., you might, you, know, you might lose the election, but you're back the next time beating somebody up and trying to get reelected. Yeah. Yeah. And you can express all your displeasure with Biden or Trump or whomever you want to just, you know, express your displeasure and do it over and over and over again. It's different. It's, yeah. it's nice. You know, I'm, I'm feeding off of what you said earlier when you made your Idaho comment, which I was hurt by. <laughs> I'm but, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and, you, and you and I have had private conversations about this, is, you know, there's this great migration of people leaving California, and, and many of them are leaving for good reason, for family reasons, for economic reasons. I mean, you can, you can buy so much more uh, someplace else in other states. But as you know, a lot of people are leaving for political reasons. They just cannot stand the liberal politics of our state. Um, how, would you, how would you counsel someone like that? I know that this is somewhat, I'm, giving, I'm throwing you a curveball here, but I think you can handle it. And how would you counsel someone that says, I, I got to get out of this state, I just can't stand the governor, I can't stand the liberal politics, I can't stand the bills, the liberality, of the state of California, I'm going to go someplace like an Idaho, like a Utah, like a Nevada that's a little <clears> bit more conservative. What would, how would you counsel someone? Would you just say, go? Or, hey, let's talk about this a little bit. Let's, let's weigh this. I, mean, I do think you should talk about it. I mean, the key thing that should drive you is where your grandkids are. Um, Amen. <laughs> Amen. More so than taxes or anything else, yeah. proximity to family. But I mean, a couple of things on that front. Um, one, it's amazing how you can change communities based on getting involved in local politics. Obviously, the president, the governor, these are figures of great prominence and great notoriety and great press focus. But have you thought about getting involved with your school board or running for city council, board of supervisors? It's amazing how much more of your life is impacted by local leaders than national leaders. Mm. The national issues are very emotional. But when it comes down to it, you're driving down the street that was paid by a local person, you're living in a house that was regulated by a local person, you're going to schools that were regulated by somebody who was elected from within a couple miles of your home, not all the way in Washington. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's you know, get involved locally. Yeah, then it, that's a great point. I never really thought about that. But the national politics, it, it, it gets a reaction. Oh, yes. It gets us hepped up. It gets our emotions involved. And even from a personal standpoint, I rarely get involved with local and that's the place, think about Aspects. law enforcement. There's a lot of concern right now. Is it safe to walk the streets of California? Mm -hmm. You elect the right mayor, the right board of supervisors. They appoint the sheriff or the sheriff's elected. You elect the sheriff. You elect the right city council mayor. They appoint the chief, chief of police. Does the chief of police arrest people who burglarize your home or let them go? Yeah. Um, does the district attorney elected local? Does that person prosecute criminals or say, oh, you've had a tough life, it's only 900 bucks, let them go. Mm -hmm. So much of what our dynamics are is failure for us as citizens to take our local responsibilities equally, if not greater so, than our state and national. You've got to be involved in all components. You vote all the way through the ballot. So in local politics then, uh, you know, because on the ballot coming in November of 24, there will be local issues as well, state issues, local issues. Are, do you recommend voting, whatever party you ascribe to, do you recommend voting along party lines or do you, is there a way to be able to transcend party lines and look at particular candidates for what they stand for, what they don't stand for, whether they're liberal or progressive or uh, conservative, doesn't matter. Is there a way to do that? Well, yeah, I mean, all local <laughs> politics are nonpartisan. So you look at a city council, I mean, you'll get mailers saying, right. hey, I'm a Democrat, right. vote for me for city council. But that's not on the ballot, Correct. basically. Yeah. And so that's why, that's the, the benefit of that. That's why a strong, active Christian can participate in the Board of Supervisors. It's a nonpartisan office, city mm -hmm. council, mayor. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody knows the mayor of Sacramento is a Democrat, but that doesn't mean you couldn't run as a Republican, doesn't mean you couldn't run as an independent. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, it's that's the benefit. And... I mean, I look at the issue of partisan vote. I mean, obviously, it's an easy way to vote. I'm a Republican. I vote all Republican. I'm a Democrat. Right. I vote all Democrat. But the reality of the fact is we really are called to go beyond that and look at the person, mm -hmm. look mm -hmm. at their issues. You'll find there are people that maybe aren't in your political stripe that actually bring in more biblical perspectives than somebody who is. 
Um, so, you know, b- voting party only is the, the easy route, but it's not necessarily the most thorough or thoughtful route. Right. So it's, it's good to do your homework, in other words. Hmm. Now, we also, we recognize that people will think differently about issues. Um, they, they just do. I mean, even in our own fellowship, I've had conversations. I'm, I'm sure you've had conversations with people that, who love Jesus as much as you or I, but they think differently on some of those things. Um, how would you advise Christians, and I'll just, I'll just leave it to Arcade Church. I know that many of our listeners are outside of Arcade Church, but I'm hoping you're part of a local church that's like ours here. How would you counsel people or encourage them to, to have these conversations? For example, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here a little bit. For example, <clears throat> I think that there are, there are progressives <coughs> and there are conservatives when it comes to immigration. Um, there's not a Christian position necessarily on immigration. I don't think that there's a, a Christian position on, in, on the environment. I think that there are sound Christians on both sides of those issues. And we have them sitting next to each other, singing the same songs, worshiping the same Jesus. How, how, would, we, how would you advise people to discuss these differences without going to their separate corners and loading up and coming out and, and bashing and, and blowing up and throwing bombs and all that kind of stuff, figuratively speaking. How, how would you counsel Pete Christians to be able to handle that? Well, the ultimate goal of being a Christ follower is not electing more Democrats or electing I'm more sorry, Republicans. I'm sorry, what? It's not. Who are you? <laughs> so <laughs> that's the challenge. Your, your ultimate goal is if a person votes identically to you and is going to hell, is that a good thing for society? You might say, well, it's good for that election. But the reality of the fact is we weren't called because Democrats and Republicans didn't exist just a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. And so it's, it's hard because there's, there's tremendous emotion and there are differences of views. And some of them are profound and some are biblically crucial. Yeah. But the reality of the fact is, is, is your desire to bring that person into the kingdom of God, to be a, a, a tool for Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit to bring that person to the kingdom of God, or is it bring them to the Republican Party, or to the Democrat Party, or the Green Party, or the Independent mm-hmm. Party, or mm-hmm. the I don't know what party I am? Because mm-hmm. the reality of the fact is, if that's your primary goal is political success, um, which is very much what I've been around and you work right. for people and right. working for Arnold Schwarzenegger, there's political success. But is there something deeper and more profound in our relationships with people that really matter? And that has to be our primary goal. I think the other thing, too, is, and this doesn't work for every issue, but the issue is there's issues in people. And I think at times we combine the two to the point that we are willing to hate the person. Oh, okay. And, you know, the reality of the fact is even if the issue of position they take you find to be anti-biblical or not in line with the teaching of Scripture... We're still commanded to love that person. I don't think they're their enemy. I think they're their political opponent. Mm-hmm. But even if you were to see them as an enemy, the instruction is therefore destroy them. That's yeah. not the biblical directive. No. That's a political directive. Yeah. You take them out, you cancel them, you wipe them out, and that's the political goal. But the goal that we were given is to love our enemies, and that includes our political opponents. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, I don't think they're our enemy. They can at times act like one, mm-hmm. um, but the reality of the fact is we're called to bring people to Christ, not to elect... Because the Republican Party in 200 years may not exist. Mm-hmm. It didn't exist 200 years ago. Yeah. And the reality of the fact, it certainly didn't exist 500 years ago. And so that's the longer-term perspective, the eternal perspective. So I would just urge that as a starting point. And I think the other part is just how you talk to people. Yeah. Listen. Yeah. Now, why do they take a perspective of... I don't think we need more prisons. I don't think we need more crimes out there because so many people are going to jail and this destroys our lives. Well, they have family who went to jail. Maybe it wasn't a fair rap. Maybe something wasn't handled right. Mm -hmm. At least take the time to understand perspective because I found even with my chief opponents, if I will find that, as one of my bosses said, a stop clock is right at least twice a day. Mm -hmm. So even though somebody you view as stuck in time, they may have some issues that you can learn from or at least appreciate their perspective. And again, if you can't, don't have the need to personalize it, disagree with the policy. Don't be rude to the person. Mm-hmm. That's such a basic concept of discourse and so uncommon in America right now. Very uncommon. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question that I didn't tell you I was going to ask you. Uh-oh. All right. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it, it's not. Don't worry. From a 30,000-foot view, 
with the presidential, I'm thinking primarily the presidential election. Um, to Christians, character matters. At least it should. Um, the candidates that we have had, uh, not even just the last couple of years, but you know, over, over history, there have been those, char- those candidates that, whose character was questioned. Um, how, what, what are some basic general parameters that we could be able to look for in a candidate? Because at least from my perspective, no one candidate re- represents every single view that I'm advocating for. There are, the candidate that I vote for, many times I'm against him or her on this particular issue or whatever. So what are some parameters, what are some questions that I can be able to ask myself that would guide me on on finding the right kind of candidate that appeals to my conscience, that appeals to the word? Um, I'm not, I don't think either one of us expect a candidate to be a Christian. Um, I think it was Martin Luther that says, I'd rather be ruled by a Turk than a a really bad Christian politician. Um, And so what are some parameters that we could be able to use all of us, whether we're on the left side or the right side of the aisle or in the middle that we could be able to use to, if the, in our mind with a clear conscience, pick the right candidate? Well, go back to your original word of character. <clears throat> you want, we want people who tell the truth. We want people who tell us, in fact, what they say they're going to do. Their yeses are yes and their noes are noes, even if you don't agree with them. Yeah. I mean, if somebody comes up to you and takes a position on... I want to support more money for schools. And for you, you're like, hey, I don't really think the school system works. I want more money for vouchers or more money for private. I don't want more money for public schools. But at least if they're honest and transparent with you, their positions, and they follow through on them, that does matter, even if it matters to you differently. Like, I don't really agree with them. Because, you know, back to your comment of Martin Luther, I think the other key component is does a person who says, I'm not going to vote to increase your taxes, then votes for every tax increase. Um, maybe they gave you the right answer to your question, but they didn't speak to you truthfully. Mm-hmm. Versus somebody says, no, I will raise taxes, and I'll raise it on people who make more than $5 million and people who make more than $10 million, and I won't raise it on people who make less than 50000 mm-hmm. If they live that, you may not agree with that. You mm-hmm. may say no new taxes, but that person told you the truth. So it is important for, because somebody will, you know, politicians will promise you anything you want to hear. Yeah. <clears throat> so statesmen and stateswomen deliver on what they promise. And that's just really important. It is important, too, to find out what they believe in. It's hard. It should be easier. From a religious standpoint or just anything? And always. You know, you really, I mean, if you go to especially candidates on the local level, it's hard to find any information on them. So it is to be a, a do, your due diligence to mm-hmm. find out where they come from. You can pull up the party platforms of both all major parties and, and read them. Mm-hmm. You might be amazed at what their positions are. But also, I mean, it is good to show up to forums and ask simple questions. What's your position on this? What's your position on that? See how they answer them. Do they answer them? As many of them will say, great question. Reminds me of my mother, Hilda. And she used to say, and they're like, but that's not the question. And so it's a tough question. Like, where are you at on abortion? Or where are you at on on issues of of controversy? And so the person saying, this is my view, um, they won't answer it. And that's also the dynamic. So... It is knowing what you believe in and then doing your very best to find out what they believe in and how they live it out. Mm-hmm. And that's a great part about America is they come up for re-election. Yeah. If they were consistent with their word, if they looked you in the eye and told you the truth and delivered on it, even if you might not, as you said, agreed with them, that's an honorable man or an honorable woman mm-hmm. versus, okay, they promised not to tax my widget and they increased the taxes threefold. I don't trust them. Mm-hmm. So I think the key thing is, do you know what you believe? Do you know what they believe, and do they consistently deliver on what they said they would believe? So really, get beyond the sound bites and the bumper sticker politics. You have to, and do some due diligence and stuff. And most of us Americans say, "I think she's attractive. I think he's cool. I think he's fun. I love the way he says things." Yeah, it's like, well, what does he or she believe in? Yeah, I mean, with all the media and video, uh, they'll take one thing out of of context. You know, we only have 140 characters or 20 or 30 seconds. That's not some, what somebody believes. It's yeah. not how they live their life. It's not how they treat their family. It's looking at the whole person because there's so many things that will happen that aren't a sound bite. That hmm. is what leadership is really in government. Hmm. 
Well, it's interesting because this episode has taken a, a different turn that I think was really beneficial because, you know, I, as a pastor, I'm thinking national politics and you, you brought us locally. And I think that is, I mean, I didn't see that coming. And that, that is so vital, Dan. That is so important for us because we do get so emotional about whatever's happening 4,000 miles away that may or may not affect us. And even if it does, it, it could be minimal. Um, and obviously there are things that we've, we've got to be in touch <clears throat> with that. But, but where we can truly make a difference as voters is from a local standpoint. And I think that is so, so powerful. Um, and I know for me, part of the reason for this podcast even is I, I can get emotional too. I can get angry. I can get, I can get very excited about a candidate that's telling me what I want to hear. Um, and that's been very, very difficult, even with the debates as, as kind of a free for all as they've been, hmm. I said, man, I like that gal or I like that guy and, uh, I'm going to follow them and go after that a little bit. And a lot of it is just because they're telling me what I want to hear. And so we've got to really be discerning with that. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, to be honest with you, we have, you have responded to all of my questions. And so I've got nothing for you, <laughs> except maybe a mug from Arcade Church, get him a mug kind of thing a little bit. But I do want to close. We want to close with behold. And the passage I thought about, you, you mentioned the one in Matthew 5, where Jesus says, you know, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you which is so diametrically opposed. I mean, I think if, there, if there's a command of Jesus that we as professing followers of Christ need to obey for the next 12 months on purpose, write this on our forehead, put on our rearview <laughs> mirror, on the bathroom mirror, whatever it is, is love your enemies because the truth is they're not your enemies. Uh, they're image bearers of God. They might be your political opponent. They might think differently than you or I about certain issues, but... If they are our enemies, then there's one response to that, and that is to love them. But I also thought of, of Psalm 2. Psalm 2, when the psalmist writes, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The next line is my favorite line, almost in all of scripture. He who sits in the throne laughs. And I think that that's what happens so often is that we are so serious and we are so emotional and so angry and so uptight about all this kind of stuff. And the one who sits in the heavens, he laughs at this. These people actually think that they're in control. These politicians, the people that back them, they actually think that they're in control. And we've got this great and mighty God who absolutely just chuckles at that. And I, I think that that is something I need to remind myself of throughout this time. So, hey, Dan, brother, thanks for being here. Appreciate it very much. This is really a great episode. If you have any comments or questions, we, we want to hear them. Even if you disagree, uh, we might put your disagreement on the next episode without mentioning your name, of course, but we want to know uh, because this is the atmosphere and this is the platform where you can be able to do that. Just go ahead and email to behold at church. Dot com, and we would love to respond to any questions you have. In the meantime, if you like what you hear, then please go ahead and, and let us know that. On What is it? What's the thing that Beth always says? Like, subscribe. Like, comment, and subscribe. Like, like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> I don't know how you guys remember that stuff. Anyway, do that. We would love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.